uh, lecture eight. This one is about digital logic design. But first off, we have a quick announcement. Uh, this one this time, uh, it is that there is a deadline uh, for running for OpsWid and for any project to leave, and that deadline to turn in the application is April 21st. Uh, so if you're planning on running, do not miss that. It is a hard deadline. Uh, turn it in early to be safe, please. Uh, the link is there. And also, if you are planning for running um, for OpsLeave, review this information because um, it's looking like it might be competitive. So, you know, you gotta wanna spend your time to prepare for the for the interview, you know? Um, and yeah, make sure you get your time Also, please reach out to us if you guys are planning on applying. Um, we're happy to give you any tips and tricks uh, to get prepared for the interview. And also, if anyone is running for any other Officer position, we're happy to get you again in contact with um, the the person that's in the position right now. Okay, and previously on ops, here's some of the things we talked about. Can anyone answer? Uh, can arrays hold multiple types? Yes. 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 I, I think that's kind of confusing. You can make different arrays for each type. Yeah. But I think we were trying to, yeah, it's worded kind of annoyingly. It's meant like if you make a single array, it can only hold like okay. one type at a time. But yeah, you can make different arrays of different types. Yeah. That's yeah. confusing. All right. All right. Second question, what are some benefits of I2C communication in comparison with the other types of communication we talked about? Yeah, Mary. Um, you have like multiple masking and multiple Yeah, exactly. Then. Yeah, oh yeah, and then uh, finally, what type of communication does Arduino support overall? Is it parallel or serial communication? Yeah. Serial communication, yeah, exactly. Awesome. Okay, this time on off, we're gonna be talking about base numeral systems. Uh, you've heard of binary, uh, we're gonna talk about that a bit. We'll also be talking about Boolean algebra and um, how transistors can be used to create logic gates. And first, we're going to start with base numeral systems. So every numeral system, meaning like the way that we represent numbers, um, they all have a base. And the base decides at which number you uh, start repeating symbols rather than making a new unique symbol. That's sort of confusing, but basically, in the way that we normally look at numbers, we call our number system a base 10 number system. Because at, uh, once we get to the number 10, instead of having a new unique symbol, like uh, just like something random or like using the letter A, we instead represent it as one and zero. Uh, which this is just what we're used to, you know? It's normal for us, it doesn't feel weird. Um, but in general, it's like, how did we really come to that conclusion that it should be 10, you know? Like it's sort of arbitrary, and uh, it is the case you can actually use a member system with any base. Um, and so that is basically what we do when we use binary. We say the base should be the number two. So if you see in decimal, it counts zero, one, two, three, four, five, all the way to nine, and then it gets to one zero or 10. But in binary, it goes zero, one, and then immediately two is one zero. Um, and that's what that means. So it's a little bit confusing to wrap your head around at first. And uh, yeah, just overall can be a little bit confusing. In general, the stuff I'm gonna cover today might be a little bit confusing. Uh, don't worry if you don't understand it at first. Uh, this is really just um, just to get make, you, uh, make sure you've seen it before and are introduced to it so that later if you see it in people's classes, you won't be as confused by it, um, hopefully, and we'll be able to understand it then. So don't worry if you don't understand it, but yeah. So here are some commonly used bases in um, computer science and electrical engineering and, and whatnot, uh, which is decimal. That is what we call our normal base 10 number system. We call it decimal. And then binary is base two. Octal is another common one. That's base eight. And hexadecimal is base 16. If you look uh, on that chart right there, uh, if you start at the left, we're at decimal. So that's just how our normal numbers are. Zero, one, two, three, and we go all the way down to 15. And now uh, if you look at our binary, we can see how that binary counting works. So it starts at all zeros, and then it's uh, 0001, 
And then like I showed in the last slide, then it becomes one zero for two, and then three becomes zero zero one one, and then it goes again like that. So it, it, it just follows that pattern um, uh, where it's, once it's like full, it just makes, it pushes the one to the next number. So you're able to represent all the numbers using only ones and zeros. And then octal and hexadecimal do the same thing, but octal repeats at the number eight uh, instead of, um, because that is what base it is. And then hexadecimal is a little different because it, it, it goes, instead of using, because we run out of numbers, right? So we decide, we start using letters. So it goes, once it gets to nine, it then uses A, B, C, D, E, F for 10 through 15. And we use that because um, in binary in our computers, we have bytes, which um, we can represent using binary. Uh, it's a, one byte is uh, eight bits uh, of binary. But uh, when we want to output like a lot of binary, that oftentimes gets really um, messy and convoluted because it's just a lot of numbers and it's hard to see. So since hexadecimal is a power of two number, we can really easy, easily reduce um, one byte to just two hexadecimal digits that we can show, which makes it just easier to read, basically, uh, which is why they use that. And so uh, when we represent bases, one way to do that, um, so that we can know to differentiate between them, is to use this subscript notation. So we just write what number of base it is in a little subscript under, um, under the number. So if we wanted to represent uh, the number 27, I have it like all the different um, translations of 27 to binary, octal, and hexadecimal. So then for each of them, we just put um, what base it is in the subscript. So 27, it has a subscript of 10, and then when we represent it uh, in binary, it has a subscript of 2, octal 8, and so. Uh, yeah. So in, inside of your actual computers, um, we always store numbers as binary. Um, and this is really simple because this allows us to just say like, if we have um, voltage, if we have five volts, it's gonna be one. If we have no volts, it's zero. And anything in between, as long as it's closer to one end or the other, even if there's noise, we always can say it's one or zero. So it's really good for eliminating noise and just overall allows us to do some digital logic computation, which is essentially the foundation of, of yeah, of, of computers and how, how they can actually do logic. Um, and one more thing to cover with binary is that if we're trying to convert, if we just have a binary number and we want to convert it to a, um, a decimal number, one that makes more sense to our eyes, uh, you can kind of think of it using this positional notation. So you can think of each digit of the binary number corresponding to a power of two, with the rightmost one being two to the power of zero, and then it just increments on. So two to the one, two to the two, two to the three, and so on. And then uh, we can use that by basically, I have, the best way to do it is just through an example. So if we wanted to convert zero, one, 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 we would say, okay, the position of this one, we start at two to zero, two to the one, two to the two, two to the three, okay? So this one is gonna be zero, because that's what digit is here, times two to the three. And then plus, this is that position, two to the two, so it'd be one times two to the two, and then the next one's gonna be one times two to the one, and then one times two to the zero. And then when you add those all up, you're gonna get your number in decimal. Um, and yeah, so that's just a way of, of looking at the binary number and, and making some sense of it. Is there any questions um, before we move on? Okay. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about how it's implemented in computers, um, especially around negative numbers. Um, I guess you can this a little bit. It says to be transparent. Okay, so inside of a computer, the numbers are all stored as binary. Uh, and it's really easy to represent positive numbers, right? What I was just showing you with the positional notation, right, it really makes sense to uh, if you're just translating to positive. But inside of computers where we're just storing bits, how do we know whether or not it's gonna be positive or negative? Uh, one bit of notation first, though, is that when we have a binary number that only can be positive, um, it, we call it unsigned. And then when binary can be positive or negative, we call it signed which if you, if you think about it, like if you think about a number having like a positive or negative sign at the front of it, that's where that term comes from. Um, and so one really easy, simple way to think about it, like why not just have one bit at the beginning, say whether it's positive or negative, that seems simple, right? Uh, well, the problem is when we go get to add and subtract numbers, that actually makes the computation more confusing. And additionally, there's gonna be two zeros now because you have 
the zero that's all zeros with a zero at the start, and all zeros with a one at the start. Basically, you have positive or negative zero, which doesn't really make sense. And so instead, uh, computer scientists um, developed something called two's complement. And what that is, th honestly, this is pretty confusing, so don't, don't worry if you don't understand it at first. But it's a way to represent binary numbers um, in a way that makes the addition and subtraction way easier. Uh, and the way that it works is that you only look at the leftmost bit, um, or like the leftmost bit, instead of just representing positive or negative, which you might uh, be tempted to do, instead we say it just uh, is negative itself, but it still has uh, the power of two number that a normal uh, unsigned binary number would have as far as positional notation. And so I think the easiest way to understand this is with an example. So just like we did the positional notation before, you did the exact same thing, except for if you ever have a one, you just say negative one instead of positive one. And so then you'll see that um, over there, it will cause us to have, if we all have ones, it will be negative eight plus four plus two plus one. And so if you have a two's complement binary number that's all ones, it's gonna end up being negative one. And then if we have something like this, again, the first number is gonna be negative. And so uh, the final answer is negative. Um, and then if you have a zero here, uh, it should be positive. And it is because the first number, which would be the one that has the negative factor is gonna end up being zero, and which allows us to be positive. This is gonna be really helpful when it comes to adding because it will allow us to add just the exact same method as we would use uh, for sign binary data. Moving on to binary addition, uh, it's sort of like the addition you learn in elementary school, you know, just like the standard addition, except for one plus one equals 10. Um, and so, yeah, it's just a lot of carrying, um, a lot. Uh, but other than that, it's pretty simple. I have the example here, uh, just showing step by step how you would do it uh, with the carrying. Uh, one, one thing to consider is that if you, if you add two numbers, they have to both be the same amount of bits especially for, um, for sign or two's complement numbers. Um, and also, if you get additional numbers at the front, like if at the end, if it was like one, 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 like if you got five bits because there was one extra at the beginning, you just truncate that and leave it off. And the right answer will always be the four bit one. Uh, there's also some stuff with like overlap with negative numbers, but we're not really gonna just worry about that for now. Uh, so what if we want to make a uh, binary number negative? If we have a positive number and we want to make it negative, so we have a negative number and we want to make it positive, uh, the way this works using two's complement is actually we just flip all of the bits and add one. Um, and that's just sort of how it works. So we have an example. We want to convert five to negative five. Five looks like that. Okay, let's flip all the bits. Instead it will be one, zero, one, zero, add one. That would be one zero one one, and that ends up being exactly what um, negative five is. If you do the, um, if you were to do the computation now, that would be the negative five. That's what we wanted. And then same thing with negative to positive. Again, you just flip the bits and add one, and look at that. Our binary two, one zero. Uh, and so the cool thing about this is that whenever we want to do um, subtraction, we actually just negate it uh, and then add. So if you want to do five minus three, you just do five plus negative three, basically. Um, so first we negate three, and then we add, and then you just add five and then negate a three, which I have um, written out here. And when we do that, we end up getting the answer of two, which is what makes sense to us when we do five minus three. And yeah, any questions about that, about binary base number systems? Adding and subtracting, two complement, anything? Do you guys all understand? Awesome. Okay, with that being said, we're going to be talking about Boolean algebra now. How many of you guys have taken any sort of logic classes or under have any logic background? Okay, cool. What, two people? Okay, awesome. So this is going to be giving you guys a high level understanding of how Boolean algebra and logic gates are used to implement and how they're implemented in computers. Um, so we have three different basic gates here, a NAND, not, I'm sorry, an AND, NOT, and an OR gate. Uh, how many of you guys kind of understand 
the difference between the two, or between an and and an or. Okay, awesome. So, have you guys been able to look through a truth table before? This is okay. Okay, so it sounds like a lot of you guys have. But basically, an AND gate just means that you have to have both of the inputs. Um, you can actually have more than two inputs. You can have multiple, but all of them have to be one in order to output a one. Uh, the opposite is true for an OR gate. You just have to have one input be one in order for the entire output to be one. Um, and then a really important uh, logic gate is the NOT, which just inverts things. So um, it's really important to understand that these gates only have two inputs and output possibilities, high or low. We can also refer to them as ones or zeros. And we'll be looking into how these are implemented um, through transistors. All right, so um, these gates are, uh, okay. Um, these gates are used to create different circuit behaviors. Um, so let's go ahead and go through this kind of complex logic gate and figure out what it's actually doing. Can everyone explain to me what the output of this gate is? The first top part. Yeah. A and B. A and B, perfect. And then what about this gate? So this one, if we look here, it has an input at B and C. And so what did you say, Liz? B or C. B or C, perfect. And then what is this bottom gate? B and C. Okay, perfect. So um, now, can anyone explain to me? Also, if you press the. Oh, well, yeah. Hi. Yeah. So, if, can anyone explain to me what the actual output of this circuit is um, now that we kind of have created or know all the sub steps? Yeah. Uh, a and B parentheses or um, uh, B and B, B or C. And uh, B and C. Okay, awesome. So that was, that was right. It's a it's a mouthful, and I don't know about you guys, but I have no idea what the circuit does just looking at it. So that's why we have to go to a truth table to be able to understand um, what exactly this circuit is actually doing. So um, in this column here, can anyone uh, point out which um, of these inputs are going to produce a one? Uh, so like, like right now, like, see which one's going to be the same. Yeah, yeah, so out of all, so if you have all these inputs right here, which of these lines is going to give us one when we're looking just at A and B? Yeah. Um, well, I know if they're all lines, they should be one. Yeah, exactly. So in this line here, it's going to be one, and then we also have this line here, it's going to be one, right? Because A and B are both one, and then we also have it here. Awesome. And then the rest are going to be zeros. Um, now, can anyone explain to me what um, which lines are um, going to be one for B or C? Yeah. Um, does anyone know which lines are going to be one for B or C? It would be the second and third one, mm -hmm. and then the fourth one as mm -hmm. well, and then that sixth, sixth one, and seventh one. And yeah, yeah, exactly, awesome. And then, very simple again, which lines are gonna be um, one for B and C? Yeah. Whatever both are one, like the fourth, fourth line uh -huh. and the last one. Awesome, okay. So when we look at this, um, and we're actually trying to figure out what this circuit actually does, can anyone explain, or can anyone identify some of the lines that are gonna be ones for the actual output? Yeah, when I raised my hand first, I thought it was like the last one. My bad, my bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ones, it be so, okay, so you're saying this one is going to be this line. Are there any other lines? Um, the fourth one. B, one, two, three. This one? Yeah. Yeah, awesome. Yeah? Um, the second to last one. Second to last, awesome. For A and B. Awesome. A and B for. And also, whatever B and C. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, so it looks Sorry. like this one, this one, these these three lines are going to be ones. Awesome. So 
I know this is just like a bunch of ones and zeros on the page, but what we've actually done is taken three inputs and generated a very specific circuit behavior. And while it may seem kind of trivial to have to do these uh, truth tables and kind of go through all of this algebra, what actually happens is these very complex or very simple circuits are going to be used to create adders. Oh, correct me if you could do that first. Yeah. They're going to be used to create adders, subtractors, dividers, and then you can also do even more complex things like de you, uh, producing decoders and encoders, which basically converts um, bits of data. Um, and so it's really important to be able to kind of understand why logic gates are used um, it, because essentially any sort of computation that you're doing on your computer or any sort of action you're doing on your computer is um, using transistors and these logic gates to perform these actions. And in fact, um, these transistors, which we've talked about in a previous lecture before, um, are the ones that are used to make logic gates. So now that we kind of have a high level understanding of logic gates and what exactly they're doing, we can kind of dive into exactly how transistors are used to create these logic gates. Okay, so if you guys are, do you guys, can you guys identify whether or not this is an NPN or, uh, or a BJT or a MOSFET transistor? This is kind of a trick question. Or not a trick question, but a difficult one. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, BJT. Unfortunately, this is a MOSFET, um, just because it has this like metal oxide side, so that's kind of how you identify it. But MOSFETs are generally used for logic design because they are um, a lot faster um, and they don't take as much power. Um, so the important things to remember about a transistor is that there are three gates. You have the gate, source, and drain. And another really important thing to understand is that by applying a voltage to the gate, you're actually able to control the amount of current flowing from the source to the drain. So in actuality, you can create a very fast electrical switch. And we kind of discussed this before, the reason why we want to use electrical switches over mechanical switches. Does anyone remember a reason for that? Yeah. They're smaller, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a that's a good reason. Does anyone remember anything else? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you have to debounce with a mechanical switch. It's a lot smaller to use electrical switches, and it's also a lot nicer because you don't have to physically do anything. You can just apply a voltage to it um, through code and whatnot. All right. So. Um, now that we understand that transistors are used to create logic gates, um, what do you guys think we use to represent these ones and zeros that we've been working with in the truth table? What do you think you apply? A voltage. Yeah, yeah, okay. So generally people um, use a range. So if we're given this range of a low value, so a zero is between zero and 0.8, and a high value, which is a one, is between 0.4 and 2.2 volts. Um, if we're looking at this gate here, what do you think the output is? Yeah. Perfect. And then the second one? It, yeah, it would be high because this 1.8 just represents a one. And then how about that last uh, circuit there? Does anyone know the output? Exactly, it's undefined because it's not within our set range. So that's another important thing to understand is that you have to be applying the correct voltage to these transistors, otherwise you're gonna get undefined behavior. All right, so now that we understand that we're using MOSFETs in order to generate these logic design logic gates, um, it's important to, to remember that uh, MOSFETs have two different types of doping concentrations. You can have an N or a PMOS, and these actually have completely flipped functionalities, which is why we generally use them in conjunction with each other. So this is where we design, where we um, implement PMOS technology, which is a combinational MOSFET, um, because you're using both a P and N MOS. And the important thing to understand that is that when you have a PMOS device and you apply a voltage to it, you're actually generating an open circuit. And then the flip side is true. When you uh, apply a voltage to an NMOS, you actually generate a closed circuit. 
So this, um, when you apply voltage to an NMOS, um, it's just like a wire. When you don't apply voltage to a PMOS, it acts like a wire. And so in using these in conjunction, we can actually create really diff uh, like complex gates like NAND gates and NOR gates um, just using a hub, these two different types of um, MOSFETs. So putting it all together, let's say we wanted to create a NAND gate. Does anyone know what a NAND gate is? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so what, I'm, what we can actually do is we can decompose this NAND gate into four different types of transistors. So um, this is the uh, functionality, or this is what a NAND gate actually looks like. Um, obviously, you're not going to see this. This is just kind of like the um, underbelly of a black box. But these bubbles actually represent a PMOS device. So if we were to go through this here, and keeping in mind that um, an NMOS is closed when you apply uh, a voltage to it, and a PMOS is open when you apply a voltage to it, let's say that I apply zero voltage um, to these A and B inputs. Can you guys explain to me why the output is one? <coughs> yeah. Uh, so with AND, it has to be both of them one, the output one. Mm -hmm. So since they're both zero, they'll just put zero. But since it's a not and, there's a not at the end of it, mm -hmm. so it just reverses whatever it is. So zero, zero, it'll make a zero. And then the not of that is just the one. Yeah, exactly. So that's a high level logic of it. And when we actually look at the uh, circuit design here, when I apply zero voltage to a PMOS, what is the, P is the PMOS going to act like an open or closed circuit? Yeah. Closed. It's closed. Okay, so um, basically, this output here is being attached to this VDD, so some sort of positive voltage. And then when I apply, when I don't apply any sort of voltage to an NMOS, is it open or closed? It's, it's closed because um, these are NMOSs and um, when you don't apply anything, it acts like an open circuit. So essentially this output is only going to be attached to a positive voltage and for that reason we're going to be outputting a one. So that's kind of how the logic is going to be implemented here. In another situation, if I apply both voltages to A and B, um, what's going to happen to the PMOSs? Are they going to be open or closed? They're going to be open, right? And so now our output is not connected to any sort of positive voltage and our NMOSs are closed, right? And so now they're actually, our output is actually connected to ground. And so then for that reason, our output is going to be zero. So again, this is the um, actual physics of how these um, NAND gates are actually created and how um, you're actually able to create these logic gates using just two different types of transistors and just uh, various different setups. Does anyone have any questions here? Um, you don't have to completely understand this. This is just kind of like a taste of um, CSM 150, M51A or um, M16. Any questions? Okay. Okay, okay. So uh, now we have, um, we're releasing new project, Game Bueno is due today. So now we have a new project, which is going to be a distance sensor. So the, the contents of this one are actually based on lecture six. And you guys might have seen this before if you uh, had a chance to look at the spec for the optional project. Uh, uh, hint, hint, it was the same. So no longer optional, now is project six, distance sensor. Uh, so if you already started working on that, you have an advantage because um, you'll know how to do it. Um, but yeah, we have the spec there and we have a link to lecture six so you guys can review um, for that. Should be hopefully a little bit easier than um, the game we know. Uh, but speaking of Game Bueno. Oh, I did want to mention oh. one thing. This oh. distance sensor project is going to build upon your capstone. So it's really important for you to have a solid understanding of how this project works. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. This is going to be due in two weeks. So we're giving you a lot of time to be able to work on it and come to us if you have any questions. And we'll also, again, be hosting a work session for this project next Wednesday at around 8.15. The due dates might be off on the spec right now, but we'll update them. Yeah.